Do you want the best recorded audio for your podcast or your voiceover project? Well, stay tuned because I've got a few tips on how you can choose the right microphone and how to use that microphone to make it the best audio for you. Hi, I'm Marcos O'Rourke. I'm a broadcast engineer here in Southern California, and I'm also the secretary for Chapter 47 of the Society of Broadcast Engineers. So you're here to learn about the three best ways to make your audio sound great, whether it's for a podcast, whether it's for a broadcast, whether it's for a voiceover gig, for whatever reason, and you need to record a spoken word, I'm here to help. So let's get right into it. There's many different types of microphones, from a condenser microphone to a dynamic microphone, a shotgun microphone, a USB microphone, a headset microphone, even a phone microphone. But all these different microphones have different uses, different purposes, and have different characteristics. And they can range in price from a couple of hundred dollars, fifty dollars maybe, even if you'd look at Amazon in some places, to thousands of dollars. Now, for spoken word, my opinion, a multi-thousand dollar microphone, probably not where you want to start off. Start somewhere a little bit smaller, maybe a USB microphone or um, a cheaper dynamic microphone. Something that will help you get started but still has good quality. We're seeing a huge explosion of podcasts, especially in this past uh, year with the COVID-19 pandemic. We saw an enormous amount of podcasts being produced because people were stuck at home and they still wanted content. So what better way to do it than podcasting? There's great options for a home studio. And at the most basic level, if you have a phone, you can use that. Your iPhone will work just fine to capture your voice. And it'll actually do a pretty decent job. Now, if you want to raise the level, if you will, from there, then you look at uh, USB microphones. This is the Apogee Mic Plus. It's a little on the older side, and there's a newer version that actually has some processing built in. But overall, this Apogee Mic Plus is wonderful. It's great especially if you're just starting out. However, if you do a USB microphone, you are going to need a laptop to record into. On your phone, you can just record straight into your phone. But with a USB microphone, you have to have that software or and that laptop in order to be able to record. I personally have had some great success using a couple of different USB microphones, one of which is the Apogee Mic Plus, but the other is the Rode VideoMic NTG. It's a shotgun mic that you can use for video, um, but it also has a USB interface that you can plug into your computer. And it shows up just like an audio interface for your computer. Works great. I use it all the time, especially when we're doing online meetings. And it sounds great, works great. So, I mean, there you go. Now, if you wanna move more into the pro level, pro level of microphones, now you're looking at, you know, real-ish microphones like uh, this Audio-Technica 4050 or this um, Electro Voice RE20. And these are kind of more of the broadcast-style microphones. I mean, the RE20 has been around for years and years and years. So it's, it's, a, it's a workhorse in the industry. And it's a great, don't get me wrong, it's a great microphone. However, if you're going to use these types of microphones that use XLR cables, and if you would like a little bit of a primer about what type of cables to use, uh, see this video, I think it's right up here, um, about different types of cables in your facility, in your podcasting setup, in your recording studio. Um, but you'll want to have something called an audio interface. Uh, this one is an Apogee Duet. Yes, I've used Apogee stuff. But another is a Focusrite Scarlett. Um, there's different versions that you can get with multiple inputs or a single input. If it's just you in your space recording, you just need one input just for a single microphone. If you're going to be recording multiple people, then you'll need multiple inputs, of course. If you want to upgrade that, I've been using the Sound Devices Mix Pre 3. It's a sound recorder but it's also an audio interface and it works great. 
I've used it for many different projects now. And I just love the way that it works and the amplifiers on it that amplify the signal. So let's talk real quick about pricing. About $200, about $800, $500. The pros are also using a Neumann TLM 103. And that's a thousand dollar microphone. I can't afford a thousand dollar microphone. So if you can, great. It's a wonderful microphone. It sounds amazing. But if you're just starting out, this works just as good. And just like with photography, where lighting is really more important than your camera, your environment is a little bit more important than what you're capturing it on. So let's talk real quick about your space, your environment, your recording studio. For me, I use my walk-in closet. Walk-in's a really loose term. It is incredibly small. But I have clothes on two sides, and on the other two sides of the wall, I've put up little foam pieces like this. Kind of stick them to the wall, and now I have effectively deadened that space. So you want to eliminate echoes. So if you were to stand in your space and clap, do you hear that echo? You don't want that. It doesn't sound professional. It doesn't sound good. There are some instances where you do want that, but overall, when you're podcasting, you don't want that. So finding ways to put um, foam up or moving blankets or comforters or pillows or um, other foam type things, whatever you can do to break up that sound. And that's why on two sides of my little studio, I have clothing. And that breaks up the sound, that diffuses it and absorbs it, and it prevents it from echoing back into the microphone. So let's get technical real quick, and let me tell you why. So let's look at this microphone right here. The way that you talk into it is in the front. That's where it's capturing the audio. This right now is set to what's called a cardioid pattern. And if you look at the little switches, it's like a little heart. And that tells you where it's picking up. It's not picking up from back here. This is called the null but it is picking up from this front area here. Now, if you are in your space and there's echo, I am not in my space, so there's a little bit of echo because I don't have all my walls totally covered in here, but you'll hear this echoey, phasey sound. So when you talk, what's happening is your voice is being captured directly, but your voice is also bouncing off a wall and coming into the microphone slightly delayed, which means it might be out of phase. So it tends to kind of cancel itself out and sound really, really strange. So essentially you want to eliminate those echoes of your voice coming back into the microphone and you only want to capture this direct sound. So let me talk real quick about the difference between sound proofing and sound treatment. So what I've just been talking about is sound treatment. I am reducing the echoes. I am eliminating the bouncing of the sound all over the place. Sound proofing is building a room that will eliminate a uh, sound coming from outside. That's incredibly tough. That is incredibly expensive. If you can do it, awesome. There are a lot of tutorials about doing a soundproof room. Or you can buy a soundproof booth from places like Whisper Room or uh, those types of, of soundproofing things. Sound treatment is going to be your friend. That's what you could do easily, quickly, and at very low cost. So find a place wherever you are. Maybe it's a closet. Maybe it's an extra bedroom. Maybe it's on your bed with your comforters over you and your microphone. Find somewhere where you can deaden that sound and make it quieter by reducing reflections. And the farther away you can get from the outside world, the quieter you generally will be. Staying away from air conditioning units, staying away from fans or washing machines or things like that, those will cause noise. Now, when you're doing it into a professional environment, you will want to have what's called your noise floor below 60 decibels. So you want it at minus 60 dB or below. 
and your noise floor is when you stop talking and the microphone just picks up the room noise. And that sounds like... So you might be able to hear the trucks outside. You might be able to hear... I have a network switch up here in the corner that's got fans on it. So you might be able to hear that. But that's your room noise. So you want to eliminate as much of that as possible in order for you to have a quieter sound when you aren't talking. And you can do a little bit of that in post. When you're editing, there are some filters that can help reduce the noise floor. But if you can do it acoustically before you have to do it in software, that will be so much better and so much easier for you. Okay, the third thing I want to talk about that I did allude to early on is using your microphone like an instrument. Think of it like a flute or a guitar or drums maybe not drums, but the whole point is you are using it properly. I'm going to, I'll use this one. All right, so here's my microphone. And, and the audio you're gonna hear is coming from this microphone. So you'll notice that I'm not right on top of this. I'm not, you know, I don't have my lips touching this because what happens is as you talk, you'll have little puffs of breath. So if you put your hand out in front of you and you talk, you'll feel little puffs of breath and those are called plosives, P's, T's, uh, B's. All those hard sounds will send little puffs of air uh, out your mouth. And what'll happen is it'll hit the microphone and there's a capsule in there and that's what picks up your audio and it'll sound like an explosion. Just that boom, boom. That's the plosives. That's popping your P's and you don't want to do that. It doesn't sound professional. Instead of talking straight into the microphone, turn away, like at a 45 degree angle from the microphone. So that way, when you do pop your P's, the blast of air is going away from the microphone this way instead of into the microphone. So that's one way of it will help. So you'll want to stay a fist to a hang loose away from the microphone, you know, six inches to about three inches or so. And if you can do that, what'll happen is the closer you get, so, well, let me even back this up. Some microphones have what's called the bass effect. And as you get closer to those microphones, the bass just really, really picks up. If you know how to use it and you're using it to its advantage, more power to you. It's great. But most people don't understand that. And they'll be all over the place with their microphones and, you know, you just can't hear it. So if you stay within this little range... It will sound natural, it will sound good, you'll have less chance of plosives, but you'll still be close enough where you're not going to get more room noise. So if you stay right here, you are golden. Now, as you're performing, as you're doing whatever audio recording you're doing, sometimes you're going to get quiet, and sometimes you wanna, you wanna get that quiet, intimate sound. And on this RE20, I can get right up to this and, and do this really, really quiet sound. E even over onto this, on this Audio Technica, I can get kind of close to it and you'll hear that, that sound where I'm right on your ears. Like, like I'm right here talking into your ears. But then when I'm back here, it's a little bit more natural. You're hearing me as if you were hearing me in, in the room. You were standing a little bit of ways from me. You're, I'm not way back here where it's picking up everything else and echoing back in, but it's still kind of natural. So that's really important is to not get too far and not get too close. Now to also help with plosives, you can get or make uh, pop screens and there are little circles sometimes that look like they're made of nylon and they'll have a little clamp and you know, a little gooseneck that you can put in front of it. That works great. That works just fine. Um, you can also get the little foam wind covers for some of these microphones. And that'll help too. That'll help cut down those plosives. Because even then, sometimes it is possible, even if you're talking 45, uh, 45 degrees away from the microphone, you could still possibly have a plosive kind of out of the side of your mouth and, you know, boom. Less likely, but sometimes it happens. The last bit of technical 
details I want to get into is your levels. And you want to make sure your levels are not too loud because if they are, you will distort. And you don't want to distort because then it sounds gross. It sounds bad. You want your levels to be loud because you don't want them to be too quiet. Going back to that noise floor, the noise floor is influenced by multiple things. One, the room. But two, it's also influenced by the self-generated noise by the microphone, the cable, the recorder. Um, if you are running near any electrical power, you could have different sources of noise introduced into your audio. So if you have it at a healthy level, whereas you're not clipping, but you're just kind of getting up there, peaking around maybe minus 12. If you have meters, you'll see minus 12. Peaking around there, your averages around minus 20-ish, you're going to have a good healthy level and you're going to have that dynamic range, which is your signal to your noise floor, and it's called signal to noise. That dynamic range is going to be nice and large where you're not going to clip and distort, but you're also not going to have to bring up your volume and bring up that noise floor. Because every time you amplify your audio, if you have to crank it up or if you put a compressor on it, you are lifting up that noise floor and it's just that it could, it could be really bad in some cases. And it just is distracting. So I hope that helps. I hope that gives you a little bit of, of, a, of a starter on recording your voice and getting yourself ready to go for podcasting, for voiceovers, for audiobook narrations, for all these different things that you could do, remote broadcasting if you're in broadcast. But these are all little tips and tricks and, and guides to help you sound better, to be more professional in your sound, and to give you a leg up on some of the competition. Because a lot of people jumping into this, into this industry might be recording their podcast or their, or their projects on the laptop speaker. That one I would definitely say, no, please don't. But anyways, I appreciate you sticking with me here through this a uh, little quick primer about microphones. If you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the SBE channel, and um, we're going to be posting more content like this on this channel for you specifically. So subscribe, like this video, share it with your friends, share it with your colleagues, and uh, give us some comments and suggestions. Um, well, comments in the comments and suggestions in the comments. Uh, on this video. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.